Good morning. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. All right. It's good to see you this morning. Thank you for being here. We have some guests with us. We have several guests with us this morning. I'll let you meet them before we get through, but let's stand together and join the ladies as we sing together the family of God. Everyone standing and everyone singing, please. somebody you don't want to know, speak to them this morning, okay? <laughs> Be real nice to everyone as they sing it again, all together. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by His blood. Join us to Jesus as we travel. Thank you. Remain standing if you are able to do that to join us on our first hymn, Pressing On to the Higher Ground.
Thank you, and you may be seated. As always, it's my privilege to welcome you and to thank you for being here this morning. For the members of Cotton Park, we expected you, but we have those who have joined us this morning who are visiting with us. Um, B.J. Thornburg, will you stand up back there, please? <laughs> B.J. Thornburg, you, you remember him. He was a member with us here and moved away. And he has a guest with him this morning. B.J., will your guest please stand and introduce your guest? This is Joan Thornburg. That's Miss Joan Thornburg. How about that? For <laughs> And I believe they now live in Halifax, Virginia. Right. right. BJ, it's always good to see you. Thank you. You can walk through this building and find some things that BJ worked on while he was here. You can know they're his because the doors won't close and the windows <laughs> won't raise. <and> so. <coughs> now, Rod Parker. He has some, Rod has some friends with him. And Rod, I'm going to ask you to do it this way because they need to know, come around here and then uh, introduce your guest. Who they are and uh, what are you going to Who are you not guys? To, not, not say too much. <laughs> okay, no, <laughs> uh, These are old fraternities and brothers of mine. They're not any older than I. Matter of fact, they're mostly young, but these are some of my oldest friends. This is Rick Boone. He's from Fairhope, Alabama. And this is, I'll clap for each one. I'll make those to their heads. This is, uh, this is my little brother in the fraternity. This is uh, Kurt Nelson, and this is, his, this is his beautiful bride, Carolyn. And they're from? Uh, they're from Houston, Texas now. And this is Charlie Bowen, Way, Way Cross, Georgia. They're not cowboy fans, are they? No, no, no they're not. They're <laughs> this is Charlie Bowen, he's from Way Cross, Georgia. <laughs> and Charlie Bowen, He's a boy. He's a boy. He's some kin. We don't know what it is yet. <laughs> he won't claim it. That's a problem. <laughs> and this is my wife, Beth Parker. I, know. <laughs> I sit. I sit right behind these guys so I can keep them in line. They're bad boys in church and youth. Now that you, these fraternity brothers go back how many years, Rod? Since I was a teenager. <laughs> All right, I have some guests here. Stand up, Ben and Alethea. These folks, uh, this is Alethea and Ben Perry. They were from Alexandria, Virginia. They moved to Marriott, what's the name? Merrill's Inlet. Merrill's Inlet, somewhere in South Carolina. I don't know where it is. but uh, <laughs> And uh, now they're back in Richmond, Virginia. Middle Oak. Middle Oak. But they were members of our church in Alexandria. They have children that grew up with our children. And uh, Ben was a Fairfax County judge. That's how I got to know him. <laughs> <laughs> he was easy on me in court one day. But welcome the Perrys. Well, they've been to that kind of before. <laughs> and this is historic. It's the first time he's ever sat on a front bench in a Baptist church in his life. <laughs> Do we have other guests that I may have overlooked? Anyone have a guest with? I do. You have, Diane. Introduce your guest. Mickey PJ. <laughs> Mickey, stand up, please. Mickey was with us on Wednesday night. He was in Sunday school this morning. And he's here this morning. Mickey, we're glad to have you. Did I miss any other guests? Do you have guests with you? All right. Announcements, let me take care of those. Wednesday night, of course, we come together for prayer and a sharing time. On Friday night, Friday night, the King's Brass is going to be back with us. I say back with us. They were with us several years ago. Take it from one who knows absolutely nothing about a note of music. This is one of the finest groups that's ever passed our way. If you missed them last time, you won't want to miss them. 
You'll notice we're going to the high school, to the auditorium, because they can seat 500 people over there. But it's a wonderful, wonderful group. And I hope you'll make the effort to be there. In fact, I have some extra of those inserts in your bulletin. I hope you'll take some. Give them to anybody. The person at the uh, uh, grocery store, the uh, Walmart, uh, ABC store, wherever you see anybody, give them, pass one on. They need to be here too, and so. All right, that's Friday night. And then on the agenda, not far away, is our Vacation Bible School, which is coming up in just a few weeks now, and we hope you will include that in your prayers and remember that. All right, and we come to our prayer time. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I got so excited about all these visitors, I forgot the birthdays. Birthdays on this side, this time. Birthdays on this side, this time. Okay, Chris? Twelve today. Balcony? I see a hand, that's all I see. Who are you? Who? Oh, Alan Barrett. Is he up there with you? Yes. Yes, Alan Barrett had a birth. How many were you, Alan? 33. That's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? Any others? Get one more. One more. Debbie. Okay. Debbie. Who? Your Wednesday. Wednesday. Debbie Israel's granddaughter, right? Yes. Right. Any anniversaries anywhere? B.J., when's your anniversary? Uh, next October. <laughs> <laughs> That's close enough, B.J. <laughs> All right. come to our prayer time aware that there are different needs represented here this morning within our own church family and even beyond. Remember those as we join in prayer together. Father, it's a privilege to be here this morning on this beautiful Sunday, your day. We thank you for your presence with us. We thank you for the presence of your people who make up this fellowship called Cobham Park. We thank you for our numerous visitors who are with us today from all over the country, really, who encourage us and who inspire us and who uh, cause, give us reason to rejoice because of their presence. Thank you for the gift of the day. Pray that you'll be with us in all that we do today. We are aware of the weather prediction, and we pray that that may not be a factor. We thank you for the promise of your presence with us. We remember those on our prayer list. We remember our military and those who serve us in various ways. Most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and the promise of his presence with us in this hour today. In his name, we make our prayer a Amen. We're going to continue to worship as our ladies remind us of a wonderful truth. We lift up the name of the Lord. Name in the highest places, 
Wonderful Savior, mighty Redeemer, bless the name of the Lord. Only because of His goodness, only because of His love, only because He deserves our praise forever and ever. His name in the highest places, wonderful Savior, mighty Redeemer, bless the name of the Lord. Wonderful Savior, mighty Redeemer, bless the name of the Lord. Bless the name. And you can lift up the name of the Lord by joining us as we stand to sing our offertory hymn, Glorify Thy Name. We stand, we <coughs> sing together, please. of doing that, including the way we share with the Lord <laughs> in our giving. Tracer will lead us in our prayer. <coughs> we'll do so. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another beautiful Lord's Day and for this time that we can come into your place and, and sing your praises and study your word. And Lord, we thank you for all the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us each and every day and for all the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon this church. And Lord, we thank you for this time of service that we have an opportunity to give back a small portion of all that you've allowed us to have. And we thank you for the ability that you've given us to go and earn these tithes and offerings, which are so rightfully yours. And Lord, we ask that you bless the gift and the giver. And we ask that you take these tithes and offerings and multiply them and use them for the betterment of thy kingdom. These things we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, and you may be seated. Before the message of the hour, the ladies are going to share with us another beautiful song. I hope it reminds us of an experience in each of our hearts. Then I met the Master. Thank you, ladies. For those of you who are visiting, for several weeks now, we have been talking about the family and the home. And uh, we're still there this morning. And there are two steps left in the journey. Next week, uh, we, the emphasis will be on our young people who will be singing for us in the service. And then that Sunday after that, of course, is Father's Day and I may want to talk to the men that day. But this morning, we're still on the family, still on the home. I'm reading these familiar words from Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 27, a, the concluding part, really, of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And this is the way it reads. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell and great was the fall of it. Gary Collins is one of the most respected leaders on family issues in America today. His credentials on this matter are beyond question. For example, he has served as president of the American Association of Christian Counselors and the editor of Christian Counseling Today. For 20 years, he was professor of psychology at one of the leading seminaries in America. And he has authored, listen to this, he has authored over 40 books on family life in America today. He is recognized as one of the preeminent authorities on family life in our country today. Now, I mention these credentials to you. For I want you to understand that what I'm about to share with you did not come from some brain-dead Baptist preacher who doesn't know what he is talking about. In his book, Family Shock, Dr. Collins makes this statement. We live in scary times. We see family problems all around us, and we sometimes fear for our own marriages and children. We see families in which drugs, sex, and other things pull family members away from their faith. We know that even good marriages break up and that kids from Christian homes get pregnant and get into trouble with the law. Having painted that part of the picture, Dr. Collins continues with a statement that has stayed with me from the first time I ever read it, and I quote him, in many ways, we are like families perched on a fault line in earthquake country. Many of us live with the anxiety that the next rumble of family tension or seismic wave of discouragement could crack the foundation of family life and cause our home to collapse without warning. I want you to hear that quote in the middle of his statement. We're like families perched on a, on a fault line in earthquake country. What a vivid way to describe family life in America today. A fault life, as some of you know, is uh, a rather dubious crack somewhere in the Earth's surface indicating where the next earthquake might occur. It's like being on a keg of dynamite that is ready to explode with the next match attached to it. The fault line in earthquake country is not the most desirable place to be. Yet one of the most respected authorities on family life in America today says that this is what our condition is. The family in America today is like living on a, on a fault line in earthquake country. The danger he describes is a danger every family of which needs to be aware that we might avoid that danger. Convinced that Dr. Collins is not out in left field on the matter, I would like to discuss with you some of the reasons why I believe 
He is correct in his assessment of the matter concerning American family life today. I would encourage you to listen carefully because all of us are a part of a family in one way or another. Where the single or married grandpa or teen, we all belong to some kind of family unit, which is but another way of saying that all of us are in this boat together. All of us, I believe, can stand any help we can get. Look with me at some of the things we need to know and do if we are to avoid the potential danger and disaster that come in, comes from living on fault line country. An analysis of family life in America today does not leave one with a very encouraging word. I will not bore you with all the statistics about divorce, domestic violence, teen pregnancy, and family crisis with which some of us deal and with which all of us are familiar in one way or another. I would like to share with you three rather basic truths on which everyone agrees regardless of their perspective on this or any other subject. These three points of agreement were cited by Dr. David Papineau in his book, The Family in America Today, and I share with them with you this morning. Most of us, I believe, would agree American family life and American families have changed drastically over the past 25 to 30 years. Those changes have been seen in many areas of family life in our society. I would call your attention to just a few of those examples. Couples, for example, are marrying at a latter age in life. And B.J. Thornburg and Don Bowen are an example of that. And then having fewer children once they do, not, that, that they do marry. Mothers now work outside the home more so than they did years ago. The divorce may, rate may have slowed down, but it is still very high. The number of single parents has increased. And we have seen a steady increase in the number of families without fathers, children without families, and families without homes. In sharing this information with you, it is not my purpose to applaud or to defend any one of them. I'm simply, I'm simply trying to state a fact relating to family life in America today. And that fact, simply put, is that family life has surely undergone some drastic changes over the past 25 to 30 years. Some of those changes may be for the good, and some may be for the bad, but we can hardly deny that changes have taken place. A second issue on which just about everyone agrees is that the economy with its shakeups and instability has had and continues to have a profound impact on family life in our country. Most families today, for example, have to have a double income to make ends meet. Some families, for example, find themselves under the, bur uh, the spiraling cost of housing. Listen to this figure. In 1949, medium income families spent about 14% of their monthly income on mortgage payments. That was in about, in 1949, 14%. Today, that figure is 40 to 45% on housing in America. Some families, for example, have been devastated by unemployment, skyrocketing health care costs, and the needs of older relatives who find they must depend on their adult children who in many cases are already financially strapped. Families preoccupied with financial obligations are not able to devote the time which they ought to to their children and their needs. We may not agree as to the causes of the problem, but I doubt that few of us would deny that a problem does exist as far as the economic situation is concerned. A third issue on which we must agree is this. The demographic makeup of our society is indeed changing. As with most of you in this room today, I went to school when we were all 
white. We had no Hispanics, African American, Asian, or Native American students. To my knowledge, and many of you in this room went to school with me, to my knowledge, there was not a single Jewish student and only one Catholic in the school that we attended. Drive by any school you want in the cities today. And the Perrys and I lived in Northern Virginia for a long time, here a lot longer than me. But you can drive by any school in America today in a major city and you will find students of almost any race on the face of this earth. And his children and my children attended the same, attended school in Northern Virginia. In their schools, there were at least 25 to 30 nationalities represented in that school. And some of us went to schools here where it was a totally different thing. In addition to changing color, we are changing age. I don't know if some of you are aware of this or not, but we are getting older. That's a known fact. Children are being born and older adults are living longer. Unless something unforeseen happens, listen to this statement, unless something unforeseen happens with 20, within the next 25 years or so, we will have more people over 65 than are under 18. And so the question raises, Who's going to pay for the health costs or the needs of people who will take care of them? The demographics make up our country are indeed changing. We're changing color. We're changing age. It is a fact that few can deny. Now to these three, I would like to add a fourth one on my own. In recent years, family values in America have changed drastically. We used to be a nation where decency and respect and honesty and integrity were admired and taught. We have become a nation where such, where such things in most cases are neither admired or taught. In some cases, they're even ridiculed. Young people talk back to their parents as well as to their teachers. Teachers are having affairs with their students and students with their teachers. Teenage students are having abortions as well as babies. In addition, we are now shooting one another. Young people let Calvin Klein and others like him set their dress codes and parents deal out cash to keep them happy. And what about what's happened in the church? Parents got so busy a long time ago that they and their children didn't have time for church anymore. There are probably other factors or issues, but few would be able to disagree with the one cited. American families and family life have changed over the past 25 years. The instability of the economy has impacted this. The demographic makeup of our society is changing. Along with other things, families have also changed along the way. As a result of some of all of the, or all of these factors, many families in America today find themselves under extreme pressure and stress. Some are like a powder keg with a burning fuse. Many, to borrow from Gary Collins, are like that family on the fault line in, in earthquake country. If you still question this ass assessment, Consider these statements by Dr. Edward Ziegler, a Yale University psychology professor who wrote the following in Time Magazine. And I quote, as a society, we are at a breaking point as far as the family is concerned. Which leads me to ask what I believe is a legitimate question, and the question is this. If so many American families are under pressure or stress, where does this stress come from? What is the cause or the source of it? In his book, Gary Collins cites three reasons that for this stress in the family. First of all, he says there's the stress that comes from the society of which we are a part. Whether we want to admit it or not, society does influence the way we do things. If, for example, society 
tolerates or encourages divorce, then that makes divorce more acceptable to everyone. It seems no, not to matter these days that some of our heroes in Hollywood can be married five, six, or seven times. That's okay because society approves. There's the influence of television as another of society's influences at this point. There are those in the industry, it seems, who try to push standards of decency to the very limits. Our children hear things and see things today that used to be looked down upon by families of decency. All of this causes stress in the family, especially in those families where true values are upheld and taught. With the emphasis on materialistic, materialism and materialistic values, families find themselves under stress. Some of our schools right now are talking about having uniforms for their students because some of the families can't afford to buy the designer clothes that some of the other children are buying. And so let everybody dress alike and that will solve the problem. But our young people are not the only ones. Parents feel sometimes that they must drive certain cars or live in a certain neighborhood to re receive the recognition they desire and feel that they deserve. When society sets the standards for us, stress is created in the families where the value standard is different. And that's what's happening in America today. As never before, the words of the Apostle Paul take on a new meaning. Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within. A second cause of stress in family life today is, that, is the stress that comes from family crises. And every, fa every family has to deal with some crisis at some point or another. A relative dies. A loved one gets old and becomes feeble. A teenager gets arrested or pregnant. A father loses his job or is transferred. A handicapped child is born into that family. An unexpected illness occurs. A father or mother slides into alcohol addiction. There is physical or sexual abuse in the family. The list is an endless one, for there are so many things that can cause a crisis in family life in America today. There are a couple of common denominators that factor in and of which we need to be aware. The first is that none of us are exempt at this point. We can't say, well, I'm my family, this could never happen in my family. All of us have family members who get sick and die, family members who have problems or get into pr pr uh, trouble, family members who become a drain on our patients as well as on our pocketbooks. No individual or family is exempt. Secondly, Family crises often are like earthquakes in that they come without warning. An accident happens. An illness occurs. A death takes place. Calls come in the middle of the night. The stress is greater because the crisis becomes so unexpectedly. A third area of family stress is that, that which comes not from the outside, but from the inside, stress upon our own mind. All of us, for example, have deeply held beliefs, values, or attitudes, and these can be the source of stress in family situations. Take, for example, a family with different religious beliefs. This can be a source of tension in some family, in a marriage, or in a family. What if a family has definite convictions concerning the use of alcohol or something worse? What if a husband or dad feels that the wife or mother should do all the housework, even though she holds a full-time job as well? What if one member of the household is a tightwad and the other one is a spendthrift? What if family do, families disagree on the discipline of children? Some families, for example, have strong family ties 
where everyone visits and helps out and hugs and all of that. And suppose a spouse comes into that kind of family situation where things are not so lovey-dovey. This could be a source of stress in the family. Now any one of these beliefs or attitudes could be a source of family stress. Combine several of them and you have a family on the fault line, a family on the powder keg with the fuse burning. The potential disaster at this point is one every family needs to avoid at all cost. But my purpose this morning is not to stand here and identify problems for you. You knew what the problems were, most of them, before we ever began. Most of us are aware that the family as we know it is facing problems in this country. We don't need the preacher or anyone else telling us what our problems are. We need some answers. We need to know how to deal with and overcome the problems that we face. What is that answer? There's always a danger to offering simple solutions to very complex problems. But I do believe there is a rather simple solution at this point. If you agree with Gary Collins' premise that we live like, a, like families perched on a fault line in earthquake country, there is a rather evident solution at this point. And that solution comes from those parts of the world where they have earthquakes. When they build buildings in those areas, they build them in such a way as to withstand strong earthquakes. Take Tokyo, Japan as an example. Several years ago, an American tourist was visiting there and had dinner at the top of one of their tall buildings. The subject turned to earthquakes, and the host said, Japan is on a fault line. As a result, high-rise buildings have to be built with that in mind. Several years ago, we had an earthquake, and the top of this building swayed back and forth several feet. Dishes as well as people were thrown to the floor. As a result, a lot of the wait waitresses quit their jobs. But, the Japanese host continued, everyone was really safe because the building had been designed to withstand earthquake tremors. The bottom line at this point is quite simple, according to Gary Collins. If our families are going to survive the tremors and the seismic waves of conflict and change, we must make sure that we are well grounded with a firm foundation and inner structures that will with strong, withstand strong movement. Didn't our Lord say the very same thing in the concluding words of the Sermon on the Mount? Using the analogy of house builders, he said one man built his house with no foundation at all. Everything was fine, as long as the sun was shining and the gentle breezes were blowing. But you know as well as I that the sun doesn't shine and the breezes don't blow all of the time on any family. Then came the wind, the tides, the storms. The house fell because it had no foundation. The second man in invested time and energy and money digging a foundation until he found a rock ledge. And upon that rock ledge he built his house. The same storms, tides, and winds that beat upon his neighbor's house beat upon his. But his house stood. Why? Because the foundation beneath his house was solid. To survive the tremors of today's society and the seismic waves of conflict and change, we need, too need to build houses and families with strong foundations. And that foundation begins with a personal faith in Jesus Christ and a commitment to him as Lord of life. Upon what foundation is, are the homes in this building today being built? The psalmist, I believe, gave us words we would do well to bear in mind when he emphasized and it could be applied to families and homes. 
when he expressed it this way in Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. That is, unless God is the architect and the contractor, unless he is both superintendent and laborer, unless he is bricklayer and carpenter, unless he is electrician and plumber, unless he is painter and floor sander, unless he is landscaper and interior decorator, we are in a heap of problems. The Lord must not only be the foundation beneath our homes, but we must let him build our homes according to his blueprint and his specifications. Those who choose otherwise are headed down the wrong road and will be inviting inevitable disaster, a disaster we must avoid at all costs. Whenever I sign a marriage certificate, and I've signed quite a few of them, there's a place at the bottom where the officiant must sign his name. And so when I signed the marriage certificate, I signed Donald H. Bowen. And though it's not called for, under my name, I have this script, scripture reference. Psalm 127, verse 1. Now, I don't know if any of them ever read it. I never read it to them. I never even tell them it's there. I just give them the certificate to that reference. That verse, Psalm 127, verse 1, is a reminder. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Those willing to be honest about the matter realize that the home situation in America today does provide, does provide us with a picture that's not too pretty. To use Gary Collins' analogy, we are like families perched on a fault line in earthquake ter territory. To borrow Dr. Ziegler's evaluation, we are at a breaking point as far as our families are concerned. And this I contend to, to you this morning is not good news. The danger and the disaster which such predicaments afford is one we do indeed need to avoid at all cost. One way of doing that is by letting the Lord build our homes and our families. Those who fail to do so, according to the psalmist, build in vain. These things being true, I have a final question for all of us in the room this morning. Upon what are you building your home and your family? Who are you letting do the building? I leave you with this point of reference, with this verse, as found in Psalm 127, verse 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Repeat it with me, please. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Father, thank you for the time together with your people. They've been so attentive. And I pray that the words which we've shared will find a lodging place in many hearts here today. And we'll be determined in our hearts and minds to build our homes on solid foundations for Jesus is that rock in his name we pray amen we continue and conclude our service by it's really a prayer hymn if you will note savior like a shepherd lead us much we need thy tender care and as far as our families are concerned that's exactly <laughs> true we'll stand and sing it as our closing hymn as always it's a hymn of commitment and response and invitation. Whatever you want to make of it, we'll share it together as we stand, please, and we sing it together.